without any uh, uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, our guest uh, speaker, um, who I met roughly 15 years ago. Uh, he was probably just uh, graduating from USC Film School, maybe even before that. His dad was one of my clients uh, uh, in California, and uh, Jason grew up in, uh, in California. And uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to Jason Schumann. Good to be here. Just to give you some point of reference, I've made uh, 19 movies that have uh, grossed uh, internationally and, and in the U.S. about a half a billion, uh, but I have zero Academy Award nominations. Ted has made one, two, and has uh, a few Academy Awards. I have a Razzie nomination, which is uh, for worst movie of the year. In 2007, I did a movie called Daddy Day Camp with Cuba Gooding Jr., which was a sequel to a movie I did called Daddy Day Care, and it was not very well received. <laughs> Although it did okay in the box office. Um, well, just to give you a quick backstory, I, uh, I did go to USC film school. Um, <clears throat> I did not go to business school or entrepreneurial school, even though that's sort of a lot of what I do now, is think outside the box and find ways to make movies and TV shows. Uh, but I got my start really studying the ins and outs of cinema. Uh, I graduated from there. I did a lot of internships while I was at USC uh, with a producer named Joel Silver. I don't know if that name rings a bell to anyone. He did uh, the Lethal Weapon movies. He did uh, the Sherlock Holmes movies that are out now. He did Die Hards. Uh, he's a very famous producer. So I got to sort of uh, learn under him. And then I worked for a producer named Arnold Copelson, who won an Oscar for Platoon. And uh, he actually offered me a job when I graduated school. So I got to work, uh, even as a 21 year old, I worked on some pretty amazing movies. I don't know if you've seen them, uh, Fugitive, Seven, Devil's Advocate, Outbreak, um, and a, a Eraser with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I got to sort of learn uh, from the top to bottom how these big Hollywood movies get made, which I'll get into in a sec. Uh, I then went and uh, wanted to be my own film producer. I didn't want to work for somebody. So I quit to work on independent films uh, at a company called Cutting Edge, where I worked very shortly. That's actually uh, one of the first times I started to talk to Ted about the film industry uh, and introduce him into the world of film. Uh, I then quickly leaped from there to start my own company uh, with my partner that I still have to this day, that was 12 years ago, uh, called Blue Star Pictures. Uh, we started in 1999, uh, and in the last 12 years we've had 19 films, and we have one TV show on the air, which I'll get into in a sec, we have another one starting. Uh, but basically, I, don't, I can go through my credits, but uh, we'll see if you knew, know any of them. I did a lot of horror movies. I don't know if you guys are into thriller horror movies. Uh, one was called Darkness Falls. Another was called The Messengers with the girl from the Twilight movies. Um, I've done a couple action movies, one of them being a Nicolas Cage movie called Bangkok Dangerous, which we actually shot in Prague a bit and then a bit in Bangkok. Um, uh, I've done quite a few comedies, Daddy Daycare, Daddy Day Camp being some of them. Uh, probably my most popular movie is a movie called Role Models. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that one's usually the one that, uh, that everyone knows. Um, and then I also did a movie last year called Middlemen, uh, which maybe some of you have seen. It's become a bit of a cult movie. It was about the uh, beginning of the internet porn industry and about the uh, billions of dollars people made in the late 90s, basically just off of charging uh, you on your credit card to watch adult entertainment on the internet. Uh, so if you get a chance, it's actually a pretty cool movie. Um, I have a TV show on the air 
Uh, it's on TBS right now called Are We There Yet? with Ice Cube and Terry Crews. How many of you guys know that show by a show of hands? Oh, cool. All right, there we go. He was worried no one would know that. <laughs> I told him everyone will know that. Uh, uh, which is actually a very interesting business model. Uh, I had never done television before. Uh, I was primarily a movie producer, but I was interested in getting into television. The problem with television is uh, you're really at the whim of uh, ratings and the political hierarchy of the networks. So I sort of helped form this model where I would go, I, I put the show together uh, with Ice Cube and the scripts, and then I went out and got financing uh, to do the first season. Usually a season is 22 to 25 episodes if you watch you know, a normal show like Big Bang Theory or whatnot. Um, <laughs> But I, I, my pitch was I'm going to do 10 episodes. I will pay for them to be shot. So I have, I'm putting the burden on myself to go out and raise the money to get these shows made. And then I went and made a deal with a network. Uh, in this case, it was TBS. Um, and all they had to do was air them. That was all I was asking them to do, was give me a time slot on their network. In exchange, if I was able to fulfill a minimum rating requirement, which was basically what I was saying, is if I can do just as well with my original programming as you would for a repeat of some two and a half men or something that you put on the air as just a repeat, you'll then buy a hundred episodes of my show. And they said, okay, well, what do we have to lose? So that was how we created that model which turned out to be successful. So the investors that I got to finance the first 10 episodes, who could have lost all their money, instead made like 10 times their money because now we made 100 episodes and now we're in what's called syndication, uh, which means that we can resell them and resell them on local stations all over the country. Uh, and now I'm doing that model again with a show with Charlie Sheen uh, so I just really wake up every day hoping he stays alive. <laughs> but uh, when he got booted off of Two and a Half Men and sort of went nuts, so the networks were too scared to work with him. Uh, so I thought of the idea of maybe going to him and saying, hey, look, all you got to do is keep your act together for 10 episodes. I'll find the financing, we'll find a network. If it's successful, then we'll, cr we'll do 100 episodes and we'll do them very quickly <laughs> so that you could go off and do what you want. And, we'll, and he loved that idea. So uh, we're about to shoot the 10. Uh, and then in June, they'll air on a station called FX. I don't know if you guys... Sure. <clears throat> that was the best network to sell it to because they buy the bulk amount of the Two and a Half Men reruns, which they do very well on, so it fit into their branded model. Um, so uh, we'll see. Maybe you guys will want to watch it when it comes out this summer. Um, so then lastly, uh, a third business that I started a couple years ago was 3D. I don't know if any of you have uh, watched uh, or gone to see any of the movies that have now seems popular in 3D, but about four years ago I saw a technology for a software. Uh, someone showed me on their laptop, basically, uh, that they had invented this software that could take any movie, uh, a, a finished movie from years ago, uh, a new something you could have shot on your digital recorder, and uh, basically his software can convert it to 3D in minutes. And I thought, that's pretty cool. It was very much in its uh, initial state when I saw it, but I thought, if there is some version that can do that, that could be interesting if 3D becomes more and more popular. So I found an investor, I put the investing together to buy the software, uh, and then I went around to all the studios, and I, made, I, I did basically a free demonstration for them saying, give me any movie in your library and I'll convert it for you for free. So every studio gave me a movie to, to test and I spent a lot of money uh, doing all these free tests for people and I showed them all and everyone was like, okay, great, thank you. 
thank you. And I said, okay, you're going to hire me now to do your movie? And people were like, well, we don't think this 3D thing is going to go anywhere, but it's nice to know that you have this technology. And then a movie came out three years ago that you might have seen called Avatar. Did everyone see it? In, in a second, it changed 3D as we know it. So all those same studios that I spent all that money on doing this free thing were all calling me back saying, okay, okay, uh, we'd like to bring on. So I started to do the conversion for a lot of movies. You might have seen it at the Clash of the Titans and The Last Airbender, Thor, Captain America, uh, and the comes out next month, which is uh, Titanic in 3D. Um, so it was very cool. Uh, entrepreneurial experience because we literally went from uh, way in the hole to um, and we had six people basically working in computers we grew to 150 people then 300 people then 500 people and then we just sold the company uh, to a company called McAndrews and Forbes which is actually here in New York which is run by a guy named Ron Perlman uh, he's a very successful so, Revlon as well. Rev Revlon. Uh, so it was a very successful endeavor, and basically in a three-year span, um, I didn't. We didn't have to sell, but we thought 3D seemed to be at it, at, it, at its height, and we didn't know where it's going to go in the next couple of years. So, um, and, and the one investor that invested in us was uh, he was very happy. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I still sort of uh, am involved with the 3D company, especially with the release of Titanic next month. So I'm still part of the technology and part of watching what happens in the 3D world, especially uh, with the future coming up. With uh, In about three to five years, you're going to have TVs where you can watch 3D without any glasses in your home, uh, which is capable now, but... It takes a while for people to become accustomed. Right now, you can watch 3D in your home with glasses, but I think the future is not having the glasses. Um, so to go back to movies for a second, what I do is I'm a producer. I mean, everyone knows what uh, an actor does, right? That's the one in front of the camera, and they act. That's all the glory. Um, everyone, I would assume, knows what a director does, uh, in a nutshell, a director places the camera where they want it to be, tells the cinematographer where to move it during the shot, and then basically instructs the actors where to walk, how to say their lines. Uh, but, a, but a producer seems to be a bit more of a mystery. Um, a lot of people think that a producer puts up the money for the movie. That's true sometimes, uh, but for the most part that's not true we get the studio to put up the money for us, which would be like Paramount or Warner Brothers. Uh, basically, my job though, is to find the material. Uh, and that can come in any form. It could come, as it mostly comes in a screenplay. Does any of you know what a screenplay is? A screenplay is sort of the written book of, of the movie. Um, uh, so we would find a book or a comic book or a TV show or an article or a true life story or just a story <laughs> in the case of role models. Um, that was just an idea that I had of two kids that get into trouble and have sort of an adult detention and have to mentor two younger kids. So that was just an idea that I came up with, hired a writer in this case a screenwriter, to create a screenplay. And then we take that. So my job as a producer is to find that material. And it can come from anywhere, uh, all walks of life. You just have to find, uh, have an instinct for what would make a good story. Um, so I would take that screenplay, and in the case of role models, I took it to the studio, uh, which was universal, and I said, I think I've got something here. And then they read the screenplay and they do sort of an analysis of whether they think it's something that could be marketed. Uh, in this case, they agreed. So they allow me the ability to what's called package the movie. That's sort of the next phase. So once I get an okay from them, I gotta go out and get a director and I gotta get a cast 
that will entice them to spend $30 million on the movie. They're not just going to say, okay, go, here's $30 million. So I had to go get Sean William Scott. You guys know who he is. Paul Rudd. You know who he is. So I had to go literally, like, I had to take Sean William Scott to a basketball game and sort of pitch him on why I thought he would be amazing in that part. I had to do the same thing for Paul Rudd. So once you get, it doesn't always go swimmingly. There have been many times I've taken actors out and they just, they don't want to do it, it's not for them, they don't feel comfortable doing the role, they don't like the script in its current state. So I'm giving you a story of a time when it actually went well. So in the case of role models, then you've got actors, I got a director, which was actually a friend of Paul Rudd's, um, and then you go and sort of present the movie to the studio with the actors, the budget, the director, a schedule, um, and then we got the green light to, to go. That's the second phase of producing, which is called production. So the first sort of phase of producing is, is called the development phase. That's getting the script together, getting the actors, getting the whole package <laughs> together. Then comes production, which is actually the shooting of the movie, which Ted talked about. Like the illusionist is 45 days uh, in Prague. It, with the case of role models, it was about 50 days in Los Angeles. And that's sort of where the bulk of the money is spent on the movie. Uh, each day of filming costs anywhere between $300,000 and $500,000. There's a crew of anywhere from 150 to 200 people doing everything from costumes to production designs to cinematography to the lighting to the set building, to the craft service, which is all the food and the, and the um, catering. You gotta feed 200 people. Have any of you ever been on a movie set or any sort of set? I've seen one, I haven't been on one, but they have a lot, You've all seen they see do is eat them. It, there's yeah. always, <laughs> <laughs> there always seems to be, people come visit, and Ted's come to visit me a few times and he's been on his own set. It seems like there's just a lot of people standing around. Right. And that's really true. And a lot of people come and they're like, I don't understand. There's so much money is spent. There's just a lot of people standing around. Well, everyone has a very specific job. Like the hair and makeup people, their job is basically to stand around until that final moment when we're like, okay, camera's ready. And then you can run up and make sure the hair is perfect and the makeup needs any touching. I and mean, that's a lot of the jobs on a movie set are so specific <laughs> that you're not needed to that one moment uh, before we're about to shoot or, or in the minutes coming to the shoot. So that's like the production. My job is basically to oversee everybody, to make sure we stay on budget, to make sure we finish each day of shooting, and also to sort of be a psychiatrist to these actors. If any of you have ever been around actors, they're big babies. Um, we basically treat them like children and then they act like children. We <laughs> pick them up in the morning in a big limo and we drive them to the set and we give them assistance and we ask them if they want any water, anything to eat. We give them clothes and makeup and lines to say and then we expect them to act like adults, which never happens. Um, so that's the production part. And then, and, then, and then the last part of that is the editing. Uh, which you take everything you've shot during those 50 days and you put it all into a computer system. Have any of you guys done any sort of editing? It's so easy now. It used to be in the old days so sophisticated. Now these computers and laptops, you can edit crap on your... You can, you, there is this just as sophisticated an editing system on a MacBook Pro as there is the ones we use in these big editing bays. But, um, we put the entire film, we digitize it into the computer. We spend months now recutting the movie in order so that we can kind of see what it looks like. And then the final phase uh, uh, of production, which is the marketing and distribution, which is what Ted talked about for The Illusionist, is where we hand the movie over to the studio and they watch it and kind of decide how they want to sell it to you guys. Like in the case of Role Models, it was how can we appeal to kids like you and get you guys to want to go see it opening weekend? So I don't know if you remember the marketing campaign for Role Models, but it was basically, um, you know, a picture of Sean William Scott and a picture of Paul Rudd with the thing of like, would you want these boys to be your role model? 
and it was sort of playing on the idea that uh, they were sort of edgy, badass kids who were, you know, getting to uh, get their comeuppance from two younger kids who were going to sort of outplay them. And that was supposed to be the fun of the movie, and, and it ended up doing very well. So that's sort of the, the last phase, which for me is very frightening, because as Ted will tell you, you've done all this work. I've worked for two years to make this movie. You, you, you finance the movie, and then you're like, okay, here you go. And it all builds up to this opening weekend. Ours was in November, Ted's was in August, for role models. And then you're just like, uh, okay, I hope the public wants to go see it. And you do everything you can. You have people go on the shows, and you do commercials, and you do trailers in the theater. And then that's it. And then it, it comes out, and, and, and you kind of have to let it live a life of its own. And then, of course, it has a life on cable, television, home video. And then at the end of it all, you just hope that you created something that has some sort of lasting impression on pop culture and society as a whole. So I, I hope that gives you some idea. Absolutely. A um, couple of questions. I have a quick one before, because for the future <laughs> filmmakers that are out there, um, we all heard about the success of the Blair Witch Project and the Paranormal, which cost somewhere 500000 or a million dollars, or Blair Witch was $10,000, some crazy number. And with the MacBook Pro today, you know, in a nice setting like a desolate Coney Island in the wintertime, you know, <laughs> uh, some future filmmakers who may decide that they're going to bury their uh, uh, a sister who will be their actress in the movie on the beaches of Coney Island, you know, uh, could you talk about that and uh, the future filmmakers and how that project got underway and is that still doable? In today's society. Absolutely. I mean, I told you the story of a, a movie that was made in the studio system. The, there's an entirely other way to make movies, which I've also done, which is the independent route, uh, which Ted's very familiar with. And now uh, a new phenomenon has come about, which is called found footage movies, which started actually with the Blair Witch Project and has sort of taken a life of its own with the uh, idea that anyone, even on your iPhone, even could make a, a, a movie that if the story is good enough, it doesn't matter how much you made it for, if it's scary or eerie or interesting, uh, can play in the theaters all across the country. And that was the case with sort of Blair Witch and Paranormal Activity, is people like you had an idea, had a story, and sort of, instead of not knowing how to do cinematography or the money to get a whole camera package and actors and a crew, you sort of take this style, which is called found footage, which is kind of fake real. It, it, you're, you're teasing the audience that this is all real and this is just footage that was found. And now I'm presenting it to you in this sort of narrative manner of a movie. Uh, and that's a, a very much the rage right now. Did anyone see or hear of Project X? Yeah, it was like that. That's, that's that same sort of idea. It's, found, it's not a horror movie. It's more about, okay, it, it's a real movie that was actually had a script written and everything, but it was done in a gritty style to say, hey, what if a bunch of students, college students, found, took their video camera and created the ultimate party of the year and filmed it? And they captured all the cool, funny set pieces and, 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 and love story elements, but we, it's all in this gritty manner. And it's, it's really a genre amongst itself. Um, you saw in the video that Ted showed you, uh, Jessica Biel was talking about the movie being a period romance, which you don't see often. And that's an important element if you're a filmmaker, is what kind of movie are you making? Because everything is its own genre. There's Transformers, which is big action adventure genre. There's Twilight, which is sort of the supernatural romance genre. There's Illusionist, which is a period romance. So you have to decide what movie are you making first. I make a lot of horror and raunchy comedies because they don't need big, big stars like Tom Hanks or Tom Cruise. And they have a very specific following of kids like you who just like to see scary movies or raunchy comedies. So they usually do well and don't cost very much. You're, you're shaking your head now. Well, yeah, we'll like take a couple of questions. It's getting very late. Um, just curious. When you guys shoot a movie, do you edit at the same time, or is it one for the next? 
Uh, we do not. We, we shoot the movie and we sort of edit it slowly, just making sure we didn't miss anything. So that when we are done done shooting and we sent the actors home for good, that we don't sit in the editing room and, oh crap, we didn't get that. So we do a little bit of both. You're kind of editing, but not, you're not keeping up. It's like draft mode or something, right? It's what? Like it's a draft, it's not finalized. Right. You have, a rough, you, know, you have kind of a rough idea that you got what you needed to get yeah. in your shoot. How come you guys decided to go with the illusionist without a studio and like do it yourselves? What was your decision? I didn't do the oh, illusionist. Oh, oh, oh. The movie maker is back. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we decided to do it because I was the investor and my partner was also a real estate mogul and he was like, you know, we did the calculations and the math of giving it to a studio. Universal did get, offer us five million dollars for take the a percentage movie. of this, uh, and they would put up all the advertising and do whatever they had to do to make it successful. We decided not to do that. That we were going to put it out ourselves. We had all the distribution already in place with the theater owners, and and when uh, Jason was telling a few minutes ago, it's very possible for you to shoot a movie on an HD camera. <coughs> Uh, or on your telephone. And then if you wanted to rent movie theaters, this is one of the best kept secrets, I think, in the world. Like, if you had a great movie, your friend said, this is unbelievable. This is the scariest thing. Yeah. This is even scarier than Ted's Coney Island movie. Buried <laughs> <laughs> underneath the sand. They're still under there, these people. Uh, you can rent the theater, and if you build enough buzz and hype, and all of a sudden there's lines around your theater, you can release your own movie all over the country, wow. and you'd own the whole thing. Okay, it's a little known fact, not many people do it, because it's very, very expensive. All right, last question. Um, why do you think it is that sometimes a movie seems to do everything right, it looks like a good movie, and there's lots of advertising, and you know, they do all the right things, but it just flops, like John Carter, it's like huge budget, tons of advertising, looks like a decent movie, based on like, you know, classic novel, and it just why? Why does that happen? No, it's a great question, and I mean, the, the famous phrase in Hollywood is nobody knows anything. <laughs> we, we, we think we know what we're doing, but at the end of the day, it's a movie. It, it, it's unlike any product you guys could ever discuss here, because usually if you're going to build a better razor, you're going to build a better whatever, lots of analysis is done and all this research, and they know who they're selling it to and everything. A movie is just this thing that starts with an idea, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars put together, and then it comes out, and in one weekend, you, the Joe Public, decide, eh, we didn't care for that. And things change so quickly. What was cool six months ago is not cool today, but you have to decide to spend the money on the movie a year before, so you're kind of taking a big gamble, and they think they take calculated risks, but in the case of John Carter, they, they thought that that kind of movie would appeal, but the, you know, a year, two years later, we've seen it. We've seen Wrath of the Titans, and we've seen these movies, and so it didn't look as fresh anymore. And that's the, the, the huge gamble that you take. Hey, you don't have to go ahead. Melissa. I did do that, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. yeah, I was just wondering how, because you just don't, you were involved in so many things, and it's just like, like one thing after another, so I'm sure like, like one thing came from another, and just once you get put through the door, it just keeps growing and growing. Would you say that? It's a lot of there? connections, I would guess. Yeah, I'll, you know? I'll, I'll end with this, and thank you for the comment. I'm 38. Um, <laughs> uh, but basically, I decided at your age, uh, any of you play poker? There's a, there's a phrase when you know that you have a hand that's pretty good and you just put all your chips in and you say, I'm all in. And that was the attitude that I took when I was 20 years old. I said, I want to make movies and I want to be a movie producer. So I'm all in and there's no other alternative for me. So I just sort of like worked for free as an intern. I got jobs holding up traffic on movie sets and I just sort of met everyone I could. I worked as hard as I could. And, and was just very persistent, and I never sort of went off track with what I wanted to do. 
So uh, I, I just sort of, uh, and I was impatient too. Right, <laughs> uh, it sounds like some simple story, like when you do that, but I'm sure there's like a lot of times you were like, wow. Like, I just sort of, there was, <laughs> but you don't flinch. You just put your head down and say, this is what I want to do with my life. And I'm just going to like keep learning and keep moving forward and keep taking advantage of every opportunity and find my way somehow, some way. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you.